Dear Bilkis, Last year, you made your journey back to Bangladesh. You, Jasmine, Shikha and Zuleikha to your homes, your families and your lives. And I made a journey too with you, reliving the experiences of feeling pushed, thwarted, coerced and betrayed as girls and women. And then surviving and hoping and dreaming and fighting again. Your questions through tears and smiles, through pain and curiosity have haunted me. And I still don't have the answers to many, many of the questions that you asked. You asked me why that morning when you came away from your village, there was no one to turn to for help. If those we consider our own are not there to listen to our cries, then who is? You asked me that why different spaces all feel the same. Why the care and nurture always feels conditional. Whether at the brothel where I was sold, at the shelter home where I was kept for three years, or whether at my village home, which punished me for dreaming. Why do all of them seem equally good and equally bad, Didi? I heard the apprehension in your voice while preparing for the journey home. You said, whatever I have done and whatever I have been through, they will take me back. They are my parents. They are my community. And despite how angry they are, they will take me back. They will take me back because I am sad. And I had been in trouble. Right, Didi? Parents do that for us, don't they? In my head, I still hear you bravely say, I will have to trust again. Otherwise, how will I go on? Maybe I will fall again, but I will have to believe in myself every day and wake up to the sun. Hena Didi? I had no answers then, Bilkis, but I held on. I listened to you and to the others, and I learned so much. I learned how to form a connection of the spirit, a connection that happens when someone talks with someone, rather than you talk to or talk to for them. I learned that care and control are the two sides of the same coin. And as young women, we need to see the difference. Appreciate and applaud when we experience it and call it out when we don't see any. And this will happen when we, when we don't feel guilty about caring more for ourselves and we are ready to face this journey alone if need be. I learned that experiences of being women connect and bind us across distances and backgrounds. Experiences of fighting back and inspiring others make us alive. And experiences of taking unknown journeys make us courageous, not bad women. You and I and many others like us shall keep walking on this journey, Bilkis, in solidarity and with love, Umadi. I wrote this letter to Bilkis almost 10 years ago when she went back to Bangladesh after being rescued from a brothel in Mumbai. Many things in the anti-trafficking ecosystem have changed, progressed, improved since then. And there are also a list of challenges that have remained. And today, fortunately, I find myself with many more allies, peers, and thousands of survivors standing up, journeying through this. Whenever people ask me, Uma, what is your core work? I would respond, I facilitate ecosystems so that there will be no slavery, no exploitation, no abuse of power. Every time I said this, there was a smaller, softer voice internally which asked me, Are Uma, this is what you are working against. You are destroying, you are dismantling. So what are you f working for? What are you fighting for? What are you building for? And then I would start talking about freedom, dignity, belonging, equity, agentic spaces, all about a world without human slavery and bondage. So, you know, there was a pattern. I usually started with a story of the world that's somehow broken, full of despair. And then I would stop and although it evoked empathy and sympathy, I realized that it wasn't enough. Empathy is not enough. 
it needs to be backed by social justice actions for change. And that required inspiration to act. So I started coming up with clearer narratives of a world that I wish for, a world that I seek to create for myself and others. My learning from this has been, you cannot stop a story of despair and suffering and injustice if you don't have a story to take its place. We will need to bring together the stories of dreams, hopes, leadership and change that we wish for to experience because it is true that we live in our stories and we, we must build the story of the world that we wish to live in because subha hami se aayegi. Since the last 15 years of my work, this has been the focus. The edge spaces, edge conferences for me have always been this space of building and sharing the stories of the world that we wish to live in. All of us here, for the next two and a half days, we will be building these stories, rewriting story endings. Um, and in, today, I just wanted to share a couple of these stories and how they've impacted me. So this was a game that I was facilitating with a group of young survivors of sexual violence as part of group therapy. Each girl had to pick up a plastic animal and describe why they identified with that animal, why they thought that there were similarities with the animals that they picked, and narrate one story accordingly. The instruction was clearly to pick up one animal. Rabia in the group picked up three. When she started her sharing, everyone, including me, we reminded her of the instruction. Rabia, why have you picked up more than one? We each have to tell one story. Why not, said Rabia. I have one story that ties three animals together. My story has three animal spirits weaved in together. A group member then harshly told her, this is the reason that you don't fit in. You don't belong because you never listen or you never obey your instructions. Rabia became very silent. The group member continued, you have too much of a mind of your own and you keep sharing openly. It makes others feel unimportant and they reject you, Rabia, and they exclude you consequently. That makes you feel lonely and alienated. So you know, Rabia, it's a cycle that's endless. The group member said this. Rabia's silence was very loud. And her quietness, it just overwhelmed me. And moments and events like this, they taught me two things. First, the difference between fitting in and belonging. Fitting in by its very definition is to cut off our wholeness in exchange for acceptance. Like Cinderella's stepsisters did, they cut off their toes to fit into the glass slipper. It is a false sense of belonging. It requires that we keep silent, we hold our tongue to avoid chaos and conflict, and we perform a repetitive role that prevents us from growing. But there are costs, there are prices in, that you pay for this adjustment. And after a time, it becomes impossible to ignore, and we can no longer compromise ourselves. I will never forget what Rabia later shared with her peers and me in that group. She said, if I do what you say, I may fit in for you, but I don't belong here then. I am not myself here anymore. The second insight for me was about silence. There are many kinds of silence as there are voices in the world. For example, there is a silence between musical notes. We tried to sing, I tried to sing in the morning. But uh, so there are many kinds of silence and music, you know, a silence between musical notes, a silence that comes on suddenly when something, when you see someone or you see something of immense beauty. Um, the silence when we invite another person's story to be heard. The silence before something mysterious is going to come up or to be revealed. But the kind of silence and quiet that is inherited or administered by shame is terrifying because this kind of silence grows out of being discouraged and devalued, and it breeds isolation and disconnection. Silence is a power because it keeps what's vulnerable from criticism, scrutiny, and judgment. 
but often in the long run, silence turns upon its keeper, inhibits one's natural impulse to speak, inhibits the urge to sing, the longing to belong, and it strips us from fulfilling our purpose. When thousands of rabias become silent, then everything that follows is lesser than truth. Injustices are not named, change is not evoked, revolutions don't emerge. Back home in North Bengal after being rescued in 2011, Yasmin was fine but she lost 12 kgs in a span of one month. She was home with her family but somehow she had lost appetite. She had to share her meals with her brother-in-law who had sold her to the traffickers but she had to be okay and adjust to that for fa family peace. Her family had accepted her but hated that she now used a toothbrush instead of datun and finally asked her to choose between the home and Mumbai habits. She questioned her connectedness with everyone around her, her conditional acceptance by her own people. For her family, being trafficked was a sin that she had committed, not a crime that was done to her. Justice was never spoken of. Yasmin found it difficult, almost impossible, to voice her pain and anger alone. I knew then that Yasmin's in our ecosystem. They need allies and advocates, not saviors or spokesperson. With this conviction, Sanjog was born in 2012 as a strategic interventionist policy and research organization working on human rights, gender equity, migration and youth leadership to combat slavery and trafficking in South Asia. The weapon and the platform was one, an organized collective voice with the intent to change and improve the current structures and systems of our Samaj and our Sarkar. Today, with mentoring support from Sanjog, Ilfat, Indian Leadership Forum Against Trafficking is a beautiful platform, a national federation amplifying the power of the collective voice of almost 5,000 survivors of human trafficking in India. So, voice is a good thing. I found my voice to share about and address personal experiences, my personal experiences of abuse and violence, which I had kept buried for many, many years. And a decade back in my co-founder, Roop, I found a co-traveler on this unknown journey called Sanjog. I found my community and purpose. Co-founding Sanjog has been exhilarating and exhausting at the same time. We have designed, implemented, and tracked multiple and multi-dimensional programs. For 10 years, we have partnered with several stakeholders for dynamic actions and doing things to amplify voices and stories, design practices of power building, create systems and structures of equity, and contribute to drafting India's first comprehensive law to combat trafficking in persons. My endeavor through Sanjog is to build and strengthen communities where we feel seen, belonged, and valued. Because I deeply believe that the time of the lone wolf is over. Our future depends on us learning to move together as an ecosystem in harmony and collaboration. Although I do believe and sang in the morning about sometimes having to start a lone journey towards changes. Akla Chalo Re. I also reiterate, we must not leave anyone behind. Leading through trauma, justice, and equality is difficult. But I have learned to bank every good memory, every win, every lesson, and fill my reservoir of resilience. I draw on that reservoir whenever I am in despair and I feel vulnerable. The strength of remembering the good, having my community around me, doesn't let me feel hopeless for too long. This is my wealth. This is my life. Thank you very much. I started what I do today uh, 13 years ago. Um, call it an accident 
call it a coincidence. Uh, I think of it as serendipity. Unplanned. And my third act in my professional journey. But for me, it has turned out to be the most enduring love story of my life. Ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you. My name is Vijaya Balaji. And I hope in the next few minutes, I can just walk you through a little bit of the fantastic, inspiring things I get to do every day, which I call work. Um, I grew up in Bangalore, uh, in a beautiful city. And growing up, uh, it was drilled into me that the only career you can have is engineering and, enge and engineering. Um, there wasn't a world beyond the world of engineers. And it didn't help that my parents were both academicians. Strangely enough, I did not have a reverence for academics like they did. Um, a few not so um, uh, correct things, including being asked to stay out of college, uh, the common word being suspended for a week was also there. Um, and I chose to do everything that the college offered except academics. What saved me was that uh, we won the doubles badminton championship and so the sports professor said she should be led back into the college because we had the rolling trophy for a year. I then went on to get a degree in business management and went into a job where neither did I have the inclination nor the aptitude. But my brief stint in the corporate sector, for which I have a lot of regard and respect, were full of mistakes and a lot of learnings. And a boss who today serves on the board of an organization, I would go on to set up the operations in India. I knew that um, while I dabbled in a few things, I was a trailing wife, my husband was in banking. Uh, and I spent the first few years just dabbling in a bunch of things after that. Um, but I knew I wanted to do something. Uh, you know, this restlessness uh, and the fact that I said by the time I turned 40, I need to find something that would fuel this restlessness and this nervous energy that I had. And so on a Sunday evening, uh, I met two people who were very, very different from each other. Uh, it was not the sort of uh, recruiting conversation that I would have hoped to have because one of them said, we shouldn't hire her. She's too much of a people's person. She doesn't know anything about systems and processes. Uh, the other gentleman thankfully uh, disagreed. And so before I knew, uh, I went on to set up the operations of an organization called Toolbox India Foundation. The first 90 days were hard. I didn't know what I was doing. And I wasn't really sure if I should continue with this. Um, you know, Toolbox, till date, uh, leverages skills of corporate professionals in their individual capacities to offer pro bono support to bootstrap non-profit organizations. Um, the first six months were, uh, you know, tested me in many ways, including my husband who told me that uh, he refused to let me accompany him to social dues because everywhere I would go, I would go looking to headhunt for volunteers. Um, but I'm glad I, I, I stuck around. There are so many uh, moments which, um, which sort of got toolbox to where it was which were very instrumental uh, in my own journey. Uh, Nagma already briefly alluded to the first meeting which we had. Um, but the incubation with Edelgave, with the belief that Edelgave Foundation um, sort of put in me, really, really transformed a lot of things for me professionally, personally, and for Toolbox. So in 2020, a year before we were 10 years old, uh, we delivered a hundred projects in a given financial year across the country. I now look back and wonder how we did it because 
we found those volunteers and those organizations who worked with us. So 2021 was our 10th year. We had delivered over 650 projects across India. We had more than 750 volunteers who had given us their time. And the biggest learning for me with that was that good intent will only sort of exponentially bring in more goodwill. And the beauty of Toolbox's journey and story is that, that the work is done by our volunteers. There are two founders who don't serve on the board. And in that sense, Toolbox really is, belongs to everybody. For me, uh, what Toolbox did was bring about that passion and purpose which I had been seeking. Now, while Toolbox was um, sort of growing, if I can use that word, four years after I, said, after, uh, I started work at Toolbox, I was not nudged but bulldozed into setting up social lens by someone who is not only a dear, a dear friend, but also my harshest critic. Now, Social Lens came about as a boutique organization. I love using that word. It sounds cooler. Um, but what Social Lens does is really work with uh, grant makers to support the ecosystem. I see myself as an ecosystem builder. Somebody sitting in this room in the front row said, Vijaya, stop seeing intermediary. What you do is ecosystem building. Vidya, that's you. Um, but a lot of the doubts sort of resurfaced again, OK? Just when I thought I was getting to know uh, a little bit about what I had to do. Is a turning entrepreneur in your 40s, uh, you're not the poster child, really. I'd started this, you know, what I came to do about a toolbox without knowing how to even fundraise. I wondered whether I, I was, you know, what business did I have to set up an organization, uh, bring in um, clients who, who's, and partners who saw the work I was doing, and also become, res become responsible for a, a young team who placed their faith in me. I became responsible for the careers that they would go on to choose by working with me. You know, I recently watched Diana Nyad's uh, story. And uh, I think for those of us who need that injection of inspiration, people go watch it. Uh, on her fifth attempt, she, crossed, she swam the open sea from Cuba to Florida. She did it when she was 67 years old. At a time when we're pushing all kind of barriers and age being one of them, her story stuck a chord for me. More than anything else, I think what was exceptional was she swam it 35 years after she quit competitive swimming. 13 years, uh, you know, at Toolbox, and the learnings have been so much. I would say that it reinvented me, it redefined me as a woman. I think it, it opened up a whole new perspective of what and who I could become. And it is only through my work that came about. You know, uh, funny anecdote, because every year at the end of each financial year, I'd go to Edelgave and I'd meet uh, Nagma and I'd go and tell Nagma, so, you know, Nagma, are you going to, I mean, is it going to be work that I'm going to be doing? So what are we going to be doing? And I have seen her expression range from amusement to exasperation, maybe even mild annoyance. Because she's like, how many times are you going to ask me this? And then one day she called me into the office and she said, OK, here's a 100 of them. Is that enough? And ladies and gentlemen, that would be the beginning of what we would go on to do with GROW. I grew with GROW. Uh, this audacious vision which was placed before me uh, and I was tasked with not to execute, uh, but to design. Uh, 
not for one but for 100 to make it pertinent. It was the first of its kind. I can't tell you about the amount of drive space I have reserved for the number of emails and files that were sort of designed and worked on in the process and let's not go into the iterations of it. But the message also with Grow was very clear. It was about how do you do this and while we will talk more about it in the next two and a half days, uh, well-being. The well-being of the hundred, the well-being of everybody who is uh, aligned to this um, initiative, this idea, this vision. And so oscillating between moments of exhilaration to feeling completely uh, sort of out of it was something that I've had to regulate. And along this journey, uh, I took so many lessons. Uh, I don't want to really talk about all the lessons, right? Because there would be so many of them. But one thing is that you're constantly told is entrepreneurial journeys are hard. They are lonely. Uh, and of course, it's a roller coaster. I agree with the roller coaster. But lonely, I'm fully not sure. Because I have been fortunate to have an entire community around me people who believed in me. To call the people that I work with as clients uh, would put a very different uh, sort of connotation. I've had fantastic partners who put their faith and money behind what I would do. Nonprofit partners who trusted me and co-workers who really walked along with me. The work that I do uh, while it's personally very inspirational for me, does not have emotive appeal because I don't see what this can do to change the life of another. But I truly believe that with all the change makers that I've gotten to work, thousand and counting, if there is a tiny bit of difference that my work brings, then that's the world I want to belong in. I want to wake up every day with a spring in my step, knowing that tiny bit of difference is going to make a world of difference. And what a wonderful world to be part of. Thank you very much. I don't know what you set me up for, Nadma. Um, I actually just hand here, um, very humbled um, because I'm speaking after um, two women, um, actually four women, Nagma, Vidya, Vijaya, and Uma, and all of your stories is also my story. In fact, I was just thinking about all the words I had typed out this morning that I wanted to say, and you've used all of them. And so, <laughs> I have to start a little bit with a blank slate. But I'm also going to begin with um, just saying that I want to talk a little less about myself and a little more, more about my questions. Um, because I struggle with my questions. And I, what, what I decided today is I'm not here speaking to you um, in my professional capacity. But I really wanted to talk to you about the struggle of our inner and outer lives, which Vidya so eloquently uh, began for us. And I just wanted to really respect and honor the fact that we've come to a point where we have um, a way in which power and resources get exchanged in today's society, in philanthropy, that we have women who are leading philanthropies. And you can already see in the first 45 minutes of this three-day session what that means for the world. And I think we can just begin with that acknowledgement. I also want to begin with poetry, Vidya. Um, and I didn't have time to look for a better translation, so you have to bear with me. I'm reading from Coleman Box's um, translation of Rumi. But I also want to confess that much of what I'm going to say, I'm going to quote lots and lots of people. 
but I'm not going to tell you where they're from for two reasons. Um, one, because I, I'm hoping that it'll make you curious and you'll go look and find them for yourselves. Two, if you can't find them, you'll come and find me to find out where I got that and then I'll get to make a new friend. You have no idea how hard I've looked for a gift to bring you. Nothing seemed right. What is the point of bringing gold to the gold mine? Our gold mine. Or water to the ocean. Everything I came up with was like taking spices to the Orient. It's no good giving my heart and my soul to you because you already have all these. So I have brought you a mirror. I hope you will look at yourself and remember me. That's what Rumi said. But what I brought with me today are a few words which I'm holding up as a mirror to myself so that I can remember all of you. All of you, this community, to whom we owe the hospitality of Edelgive. I think it's important that we acknowledge this hospitality. It's a, I think we forget how important hospitality is in, to, in today's, um, today's world. The conviviality and the friendship to imagine and dream a different and more equal world. And I'm convinced that that's a mirror that we all look into every day. I don't think I have to really try very hard to say that we have different sets. We, I'm sure we have different sets of mirrors. But one mirror we all share, I think, is the one where we really dream that dream of a more equal world. And so what I'm sharing with you are my questions in this magic hall of mirrors. And what I want, I'm hoping to lay, before, lay bare before you today are my questions, my ideals, and my struggles. But I've always wondered if our ideals, what we hope for, our mirrors that we hold up to each other, how are we going to frame our questions? What is it that we will ask each other over the next three days? Why are some of our mirrors convex? What makes some of them concave? Why is the glass sometimes a lens and at other times a prism? Why do mirrors just only reflect, but sometimes we also need them to refract, to show us more than what we can see? And so while the invitation was offered to Uma and Vijay and I to share our solo journeys, I just couldn't shed the feeling that it really had to talk about the community, that the feeling of community that Edge invokes in me. I did have the privilege of speaking at the last Edge, where I was asked to talk about Dr. Martin Luther King and the civil rights movement, and how philanthropies helped the civil rights movement. What separates us between that moment at the Edge five years ago and today is that great pandemic which seems invisibilized but not forgotten inside all of us. And as Vidya said, we've emerged isolated, I think, in different ways after that pandemic. Our realities have become darker, inequality has grown, and the planet continues to choke in the confusion that's created by our conflicting desires. Valentine's Day is coming up, so I do want to talk about love and desire. Um, but I want to return to the idea of friendship. The Buddha has said that according to dharma, practicing karuna, compassion, is not enough. Kindness and compassion by themselves prove at many times, he says, morally inadequate without maitri. Maitri is not just friendship. It is preserving and nurturing the force of individuals and community. And I really want to acknowledge, just take a moment for all of us to just acknowledge that this is what the gift that it give has offered us today. So gatherings such as this, I think, help us bring together, not just in our lives of what we do as professionals, but both our inner and outer lives. So what I'm going to speak to you about today is a bit of a meander. It's a zigzag um, about the space that we work in. I want to be very careful and not use the word sector. And if I do, you can find me later. But I've always wondered why it's always clear that we know what the public sector is, the government, we know what the private sector is, but who are we? 
I keep, even in the, in the few years that I've been in the donor space, I've heard so many words. The development sector, the social goods sector, the not-for-profit sector, more, uh, more recently the impact sector. Isn't it incredible that we've not really been able to find the shared language to name ourselves? Because we don't name ourselves, it's others who are naming us all the time. But I always wonder also if this is a reflection of the diversity of the backgrounds, of the purpose, of the aims, of where we come from, and of where this work fits into the system in the larger structural orders that we all inhabit. Is this a reflection also of the diversity of desires that are bringing us together? And then I wonder if there is this diversity, then how do we bring a shared experience and understanding of this life world, this life world of change? So what I'm searching for, along with all of you today, is to bring into conscious relationship philanthropy, which is supposed to be the love for humanity, and the desire for the resources that we give. We give money, we give ideas, we give effort, we want to deliver, we do all this because we want to deliver results. And all of this sits in a dynamic relationship. We negotiate this relationship between our inner lives and our spirits. I mean, we heard a philanthropist this morning, we heard Vidya, and what we heard was her inner life and her spirit with the outer life of action and service that we all want to, um, that we're all here to engage in, to talk about. A very little short story about myself. I was born in Hyderabad, not very far from Kakinara. Um, she grew up on the rivers of the, on the banks of the Godavari and my ancestors on the banks of the Krishna. Um, and I, like you, Vijaya, was told I had to be a doctor. I mean, you know us, Andhra people, engineer, doctor, not very imaginative. Now everyone's a computer scientist. Um, and they, they just wasn't really like scope to think to think much beyond that. But I was very fortunate. I had an I had a cousin who um, had a small NGO called the Trans Health Foundation, and he would do health camps in um, tribal areas outside of Hyderabad. So as 13, 14 year old, I, I got to go there. And everything seemed bizarre to me about this work. You would go and there would be a healthcare mela. It was a celebration. You were supposed to be delivering healthcare services. And my little 13, 14 year old mind would say, but how is this supposed to make their lives better? There were charts that would say, don't use oil to fry too many times. And I would think in my middle class home, we had to use oil so many times. Why are we telling people who don't have access to resources not to reuse their oil? Like nothing really made sense. But that was my exposure to the development world until my family immigrated to Canada. And I was studying to be a doctor. Um, and somewhere in my second year of training, I was in this extremely well-equipped hospital um, with our professor all the students around, and we barely looked at the patient. We looked at their charts, analyzed the results, um, the machines were told what to do for the patient, and we left, and I said, is this how you make somebody better? And the stark difference in resources between what I had seen as a 13 or 14 year old at the health camps in Adilabad and Kingston, Ontario, just struck me. I was 19 and I said, how can so many resources be dedicated to cure one individual when there's so many in my country that need health care? And I said, okay, I have to study public health. We have to do, I have to do something big. Can't just be doing one patient at a time. So I quit medicine and I went into population health because I thought we need systems because systems leave people out. They leave communities out. But I also realized that systems are ideals. Ideals never always just make us whole on their own. But I was very fortunate that my public health training in the 90s was still very much influenced by the wonderful Alma Atta Declaration. Whoever hasn't read it, please go read it. And I worked in uh, tuberculosis prevention with immigrant and refugee communities. And what we realized was when sub-Saharan refugees came to Toronto, um, there were large numbers of them that came. 
their relapse rate of TB was highest in the first two years of them immigrating to the country. They're coming to a country with better health care, universal coverage. They didn't have to pay for it, but they were getting sick. And our research showed that a lot of it had to do with the lack of power they felt in their own life. Their levels of stress were so high. Their decision making was limited. And, and that's what we began to really realize in, in our public health space was there was a direct correlation between the powerlessness that one feels and your experience of health. Ill health was really a biological manifestation of deprivation. So if equity is really tied to power, then what are the ways in which we can share power? I mean, I think it's accidental like Nagma, serendipitous like you that I ended up in philanthropy. I never imagined myself in this place. I always thought I'd be a public health practitioner. But I always asked myself then if powerlessness is what we have to address to solve the healthcare crisis that the world is in, then what is the most radical way to share, share power? Again, we think of resources, time, money, expertise, knowledge, know-how, how to be strategic, how to be tactical. I do all that in my day job, but I'm not on my day job. Now. And so I th thought about where the work is located that I want to do, and it was called the development sector. And I always wondered, where does this idea of development come from? Because development is a very linear idea. We know that from psychology also, right? It's linear. You're here and you need to get there, right? You're third world and you need to become the first world. Um, and in the work that we do day to day, I think we forget and we invisibilize the histories that actually determine where we find ourselves today. In colonial times, no one thought of development in the same way that we do today, right? In colonialism, it's not a very distant reality for us. I'm still speaking to you in English. So There's an anthropologist, come find out who he was later, who said, in colonial times, concern with poverty was conditioned by the belief that even if the natives could be somewhat enlightened by the presence of the colonizer, not much could be done about their poverty because their economic development was pointless. The natives' capacity for science and technology, and the base, which is the very basis of economic progress, was so limited that they really could never come out of it. But you know, World War II changed all that. And for the first time, it, it appeared that the destinies, destinies of rich countries were tied to the destinies of poor countries. You have to bear with me if I'm speaking to a lot of experts in the room about the development sector, but I do think it's important for us to reflect. But after World War II, there was an expanded faith that the ability of technology, science, social engineering to solve humanity's long enduring problems, disease, malnutrition, this becomes the foundation of the modern era for development. And we have the development approach which hasn't left us. We, we still believe in that. But think about it, World War II ends, Europe reconstructs in five years. And what message does it give the world? It says, oh, the poor countries are poor because they just haven't developed the technological and social infrastructure. You, can, you have to have progress. Primitive agricultural economies must become industrialized economies. So then we have a modernization model of development. So I'm thinking about all this. I'm thinking about how, where is power? Where is change? Where is the love for humanity on all this? Please hold that question in the back of your mind. So modernization gives us the terminology of first world, second world, and third world. We don't hear much about the second world anymore. But by the 1960s, the colonized countries were waking up. And they were wondering, asking why it wasn't any longer the policymakers of the US and the USSR that were determining development pathways, right? It was third world scholars who coined the dependency theory. And they challenged modernization and said, poverty in the South is not because of our cultures, not because we're primitive, not because we are inherently non-scientific, but because you, you have to look, you have to understand poverty in the South from colonial and neo-colonial relationships. And so I kept struggling with these questions. I kept struggling with understanding how there is a pathway for how we imagine development and 
what happens on the ground when you actually really need to make the change happen, like the work that Uma does, you know? Um, the 90s, of course, the environmental crisis breaks out and then we have sustainable development. It was very clear that a world in which there was going to be poverty and inequity, you would always have ecological problems. So sustainable development comes out. Post 90s, we all know what globalization did to our world. And with globalization, the world order has changed. There is a rise in the role of capital. There's less importance of states and government and more importance of markets and corporations. And I don't need to say much about the era that we're living in today. There's a promise of technology that hasn't changed, the rise in capital, the faith in growth, this form of growth, to solve for the most intractable problems that we face uh, today. I, I, I think it's important that we still hope. Vidya, you remind us about the importance of hope. And therefore, the faith that there will be a better world is not something that I question. But I do question the means. I do believe that we should all question the means. And that's where I ask myself, because I look, of where I'm located today, where is philanthropy in all this? Where is the love for humanity? And how does it relate to the desire for development? Valentine's Day. Um, so I, came, I come to the second experience that shaped my questions. So I wanted, I said, you know, this, this desire space of development, and I seem to be able to do very little in it. I wanted to do something with love. Less desire, more love. So um, I had an opportunity. My family moved from Canada to India. I had a great love for the performing arts. So I tried to build a collective of artists, practitioners in the traditional performing arts. It was called the Antara Collective in Bangalore. It was an attempt to build an institution on the power of love. Love for the art, the practice, and the practitioner. It's something that, Vidya, I share very deeply with you. I, I loved the art. I loved the artists. And the outcome that we were driving for was sustainable livelihoods for artists. Very developmental framing. And as I tried to build the institution, I faced all the challenges that modern institutions do. Systems, resources, love just didn't seem enough. Resources were very hard to come by. We had to register, we had to formalize, we had to raise funds. Nobody funds the arts in this country. My NGO did not survive. But the artists thrived. Their work flourished, their livelihoods settled to something, towards something that appeared sustainable. But I felt for a long time that the endeavor had failed. But over time, I feel perhaps that this was an initiative that was rooted in love, but it had not articulated its desire very clearly. So I don't think, but I, I, I place this before you, I don't think I'm still asking myself the right questions about what that experience has taught me. And it still remains unresolved within me. But I am trying to figure out how power works when it comes to ideas. How do you connect it with the resources and how we build community? So I want to come back to the question that I started with. What is the most radical way to shift power that we can imagine for a more just world? What is the pathway to the transformation that results from contestations and interrogations of our own assumptions and presuppositions. It is these experiences that accidentally and serendipitously brought me to philanthropy. And then I thought, hmm, love for humanity. You know, I grew up in, on four continents and I had my schooling was in five languages. So I always have to unpack language for me to conceptually be able to transfer across. So I thought, okay, philanthropy, philia from Greek, love, caritas from Latin, love. But it's a special kind of love. It's just not any love. Philia is a love which is a form of friendship. It is not eros. It is philia. It's not agape, which is just general love for all. It's philia. It is the friendship which is a strong bond that exists between people who share common values, interests, and activities. 
very appropriate for what we do. But is there a relationship? You know, we always say, you know, we've, the philanthropies evolve from, we've evolved from being a charity to a philanthropy. What does that mean? I hear that all the time. The trusts also say that. Means that you've moved from giving to sharing. Is that what it means? I don't know. But I think it's important we ask ourselves because we're now beginning to think of the philanthropy sector as a professionalized sector. We've given it a name. We're, we're, we're giving it a structure. Um, but there's a word, caritas, that's very similar in Greek as well. Caritas is Latin. In Greek, it's charis. Charis is not love. It's desire. And I always ask myself, Desire is a force that drives. It's a very, very important force. But is love power? And that's a question that I sit with. When I was here last at EDGE, I ended my talk with a quote from Cornel West, and I want to remind us of that talk again. Because while we all hold up that mirror to ourselves about what a more equal and just world would look like, what is it that we mean by justice? Cornel West says that justice is what love looks like in public. Just like tenderness is what love feels like in private. He also goes on to say that when you love people, you hate the fact that they're being treated unjustly. Justice is not simply an abstract concept to regulate institutions. It is also the fire in the bones to promote the well-being of all. And so with our friendship, the friendship in old traditions is often referred to as the highest point to which virtue can reach. We all want to be virtuous at some level, I think. But virtue here is the habitual facility of doing good things. And that habitual facility is facilitated by community. And so that is why we need each other to cultivate that habitual facility of doing good things. So I want to close today by reminding us of what Ambedkar said since we're standing in a place named after him. He too asked for Maitri. He describes it as a fellow feeling of all beings not just to one who is a friend, but to a foe. Not to man, woman, but to all living beings. So thank you, Edelgive, for this community, for friendship. And perhaps we can imagine now a philanthropy which will have a little more love and a slightly different form of desire. Thank you.